Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. The Bible says in Isaiah 54, 17, No weapon formed against you shall, and every tongue that arises in judgment against you, you shall condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. According to that verse, what is your heritage? The righteousness of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In this new verse that I really like, it's Philippians 1, 6, and it says, Being confident in this very thing, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. I was talking to Sister Winnie earlier here. I'm not going to put her on the spot. But she summed up what we're going to talk about today by saying this. God wins. God always wins. You see, the thing is, Satan is already defeated. So today I ask God's people, choose today whom you will serve. I don't know how many of you guys came into church today feeling defeated. Can you hear me a little bit better? I don't know how many of you guys came to church today feeling weary or heavy laden. But it is our prayer that when you walk out of the church today, you will know that there is 100% victory in Christ Jesus. You know, Jesus says something in the Bible. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In Galatians 5, 9, Paul says a similar thing. He says, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. The equivalent to that today would be our idiom. Have you guys ever heard of this saying that one bad apple spoiled the bunch? This is what Jesus and Paul were talking about. See, the problem during the wilderness experience is that while God's people were claiming God in the wilderness... When it was time to move by faith and live by faith, they cowered and they feared. It was because of unbelief. So brothers and sisters, today we're going to have a Bible study. And I don't know how many of you guys have your Bibles with you. Anybody have your physical Bibles with you? Um, more than usual. Okay, praise God. Other churches, sometimes I ask how many guys have Bibles and they raise their phones. So I have extra Bibles right here. And feel free to look at the verses we're going to have on the screen. But brothers and sisters, Jesus is coming very soon. And you guys are all welcome to have your Bibles here. Pick up a Bible if you need to. There's Bibles here for you. Notice this on the screen. It says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16 through 19, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who did not obey, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. You see, the thing is, brothers and sisters, when God took Israel out of Egypt, he had every intention of taking Egypt out of Israel. How many of you guys would agree that we are currently in the wilderness season? Do you see it all around you? Now the thing was, even though the wilderness is uncomfortable, the wilderness was supposed to be a detox for the people of God. Do you remember what story Paul here in Hebrews is alluding to? What happened with the 40 years? Do you, does anybody remember this story? Let's go to Numbers. Chapter 13, verse 30 to 32, I want you all to read it for yourselves. This is Numbers, chapter 13, verse 30 to 32. And when you get there, please let me know. Numbers 13, 30 to 32. You see, the problem with Israel is that while God was trying to detox them in the wilderness, they had Egypt in their bellies. They had Egypt on their hearts. They had Egypt on their minds. And this was the very reason why they thought that they couldn't overcome. Look at what Numbers says. 
Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Was Caleb part of the two or the ten? So Caleb is saying, we can surely overcome. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out. See, brothers and sisters, the problem is when you listen to the leaven of those who believe you cannot overcome, you start believing that you can't overcome. But if there is one truth for God's last day people that must be listened to, appreciated, and understood, it is Christ our righteousness. In Spanish we say, Cristo nuestra justicia. What does Christ our righteousness mean? You see, as Seventh-day Adventist people, we have the most precious message given to mortal man an accumulation of all the truths from the very time of Adam to our modern day today. And the good news is, Christ is our righteousness. Now the iffy news, the bad news is, we sometimes don't know what that means. You see, the ten spies, they shared their unbelief and became a stumbling block to the people of God. There's no way you can overcome. They were saying, there's no way that you can take that beautiful land. Notice this, the land was literally called the promised land. Who promised it? And the people of God, for listening to the leaven of unbelievers, died in the wilderness for their unbelief. In fact, today I have many questions for you, but one of them is is this. I want you today to imagine yourselves in the border, on the borders of the heavenly Canaan. Picture yourselves with the headscarves and the sandals and picture yourselves being in 110 climate. Now I want you to imagine that you guys are in the camp of Israel and you hear murmurings around, murmurings around the camp and whispers that the spies are back. Their spies are back. So you guys are all rushing to hear what the spies have to say about the promised land. Today, God's people, I have a question for you and it is this. Which of the spies would you believe? Would you believe Joshua and Caleb that say it is well able for us to overcome? Or would you listen to the ten spies that said there's giants in the land? There's no way we can overcome. Which one would you believe, brothers and sisters? Joshua and Caleb or the ten spies? And this is a, this is a real, real question. Because today I want you guys to answer it for yourselves. You see, the world is debilitated by sin. And the world is in desperate need to see and to hear people that in Christ Jesus have overcome the very things that the world is struggling with. So the question is, do you accept and believe that in Christ Jesus, the promised land is yours? Jesus is coming soon. And we are on the borders of the heavenly Canaan. Will we listen to Joshua's report or the ten spies? Before we begin, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this time that you have given us, O Lord, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. There is no time like the present for our people, for your people, Lord, to worship you and surrender themselves completely to Jesus, our righteousness. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit and prepare us, O Lord, for that promised land. In Jesus' name we pray, and by your blood we claim salvation. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'll let you in on a little secret. If there is one message that Satan does not want the last day people of God to know is the message that in Jesus there is 100% victory. If there is one message that Satan does not want people to understand. It is the message of righteousness by faith. Our scripture reading is found in Philippians 1, 9 through 11. Today we're going to have a Bible study together. And our scripture reading is found in Philippians 1, 9 through 11. 
You know, the title of our sermon today is Wilderness Wanderers, Our Hearts Revealed. We can all agree that the wilderness is uncomfortable. In fact, the wilderness is miserable. But the thing about the wilderness experience is that it exposes our hearts. It forces us to choose, to make a decision whether we will choose Christ, our righteousness, or we give up and die in the wilderness. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 through 11 says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with what? Which are by whom? The fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. I have a question. Remember, this is a Bible study today. It's going to be a sermon Bible study format. And you'll notice that we are supposed to be in a certain condition before the coming of the Lord. What does Philippians 1, 9 through 11 say that condition is? In verse 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. Christ our righteousness. The spirit of prophecy says something very powerful, and this is found in the ministry of healing and in Christ object lessons. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Let no one say, I cannot remedy my defects of character. The real difficulty arises from the corruption of an unsanctified heart and an unwillingness to submit to the control of God. Subjection to the will of Christ means restoration to perfect manhood. Let nobody tell you that you can't overcome. You see, when Christ is victorious, seated on the throne of your hearts, he has an answer for the depression in your life. He has an answer for the overindulgence in your life. He has an answer for your neighbor who hates God. He has an answer for the crippling bills that are piling up. He has an answer for the very things that you think are too big for God to conquer. Does that make sense? Let no one tell you that you can't overcome. Christ our righteousness is the last day message for God's people to understand that in the last days there will be a people so surrendered to Christ that it is only Christ who lives in me. That's Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, the beauty of the last day message is telling a doomed world that there is victory only in Jesus. You ever notice? You ever talk to somebody who went through the AA programs? And it's amazing because they tell me they have their little chips and they tell me, I have some friends, that they've been sober for 12 years. And I'm curious and I ask them, how'd you do it? And they say, the AA program. I've had an addiction with gambling, they say, for 50 years and I have been delivered, I haven't been gambling in 10. And I asked them, How, how'd you do it? It was the self-help counseling groups. More than anyone in this whole wide world, God's last day people should remind the world that victory is not in self-help. Victory is not in AA. You see, the world attributes victory to their humanistic philosophies. Have you seen that before? They attribute victory to psychology, and to therapy, and to self-help books. They attribute victory to all the things in the world for the glory to be for themselves. But as Bible believers, we know that victory is only 
in Christ Jesus. I want you to notice Numbers 14. Go in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 14. We're going to read a little bit of context about what Paul says in Hebrews. Because it's shocking, brothers and sisters. You see, Paul says, they died in the wilderness because of unbelief. So when you're in chapter 14 of Numbers, before we start in verse 1, read just a little bit back in Numbers 13, the last verse. It says in 31, But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land with which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. They, there we saw what? Giants. Let's stop right there. So the philosophical, theological, biblical question for God's people is this. Is your sin greater than the Most High God? Why did the people die in the wilderness? I want us to think about this. Can you say that louder? My brother. Imagine seeing the Red Sea part and the pillar of fire by night and the cloud during the day. Imagine seeing 10 end-of-the-world plagues fall on the very country that was oppressing you, Egypt. And imagine getting to the place where after hundreds of years, God is now saying, remember that promised land I gave you that I was going to give to you? Here you go. You can take it. And imagine thinking that the giants are bigger than the God who gave the plagues. Is God bigger than the problems in your life? Because notice this. The same problems that we as God's people have are the same problems that the world has. You notice that? Everybody needs money, guys. Everybody needs money. And everybody has issues with their family. But the only difference between us and them is that we have a God who solves problems with his mighty hand. The world is in desperate need to see the glory of God reflected on the faces of his children. How did, face, how did Moses' face look when he was beholding God's glory? How did Stephen's face look when he was being stoned? How do you think your face is going to look like when you're on your knees praying like Sister Winnie? When you're reading the Bible like Brother Nathan? When you're sharing the good word like Rebecca through music? You see, when you are in the most holy place experience beholding a mighty God, your problems start to shrink. And as John said it, the problem is Israel forgot about their great God when they saw the giants in their life. Imagine this. Do you remember while they were walking towards the heavenly Canaan, or the earthly Canaan, I mean? Do you remember while they were walking, what did they crave when God gave them bread? They craved Egyptian food. Notice Numbers chapter 14. Look what it says in verse 1. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried out, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Remember, the wilderness is only for detox. God's plans, for I know the thoughts I have for you. They're not thoughts of evil or of death. They are thoughts of the heavenly promised land. And they said, if only we would have died here. Detoxing is too hard. I can't overcome. I'm stuck like this forever. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Look at this. Verse 3 says, Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, 
who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. Verse 7 says, And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Verse 9, Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear. I want you to notice the response of God's people. In verse 10 it says, And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of meeting before all the children of Israel. When the message came of victory in Jesus, what did the camp want to do? I beg you, God's people, do not stone God's messengers. I beg of you, God's people, Jesus is coming soon. Satan does not want you to know that in Jesus you can defeat the enemy's accusations and attacks. Have you noticed negligence in studying the Word of God? Christ can overcome. Have you noticed the lack of appetite for coming to church? Christ can overcome. Sister Winnie and I again were talking, and if there's one thing Satan really wants to destroy is your understanding of your free will that you can exercise for him, for the Lord. See, if Satan convinces you that you can't, you can't choose Jesus, your sin is way too big. How effective was Satan's giant before David's God? Really, think about it. When they see you, who do they see? Let me give you an example. Two Sundays ago, my wife and I hosted 13 foreign exchange students from the U of M. Now we have a friend who's at the U of M and she works for an organization that connects people from other countries with Americans living in Minnesota and we get to show them around the parks, show them around the American way of life. Now here's something interesting. Before we had them over, my wife and I were debating what should we serve them to eat. And let me just put it bluntly with it for you. We debated whether we should feed them Egyptian food or the food that comes from God. You see, the thing is, my wife and I, we were going back and forth. Well, I don't know if they eat like us. Should we serve them what we're growing? Should we just order them McDonald's and pizza? And we ended up deciding we're going to serve them what we eat in our household. And we didn't think about it. So two days later, they came to our house. My wife and I cooked all day. And they came to our house, and we had been praying that the Lord open up a door for those people to come to him. Notice what happened. We're serving our food after we pray. And this lady, a Chinese lady, an older lady, she asks, what do you guys do? And we told her, we preach the gospel. What church are you from? We're a Seventh-day Adventist people. Her jaw dropped to the floor, and here's why. Because little did I know that for years she's been praying to meet the Seventh-day Adventist people because she read in an article that the people of God live the longest because of what they eat, because of who they serve. Do you remember that video I showed you? In fact, the Seventh-day Adventist people, secular studies say, live 11 years longer. So she opened the door, and that whole day, I think it was eight hours, it became a living, walking, breathing Bible study. Thirteen different people from different countries. Indonesia, Taiwan, China, India. They learned about the state of the dead. They learned about the Seventh-day Sabbath. They learned about Christ our righteousness. Brothers and sisters, when they see you, who do they see? When they come into your church, who are they acquainted with? You see, the problem is, before Jesus comes, he is not waiting for his bride to preach a defeated gospel. Yeah, I know Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, but I'll be addicted to porn all my life. 
Jesus loves me, but you see, I just, he's not that strong to defeat the gambling issues I have. See, the world doesn't want to know more defeat. Satan already has them bound to defeat. What the world is dying for is to see Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Behold, Spirit of Prophecy, The Review and Herald, 1899. The righteousness of Christ as a pure white pearl has no defect, no stain, and no guilt. This righteousness may be ours. Salvation with its blood-bought inestimable treasures is the pearl of great price. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented, for he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. What does righteousness by faith look like? It looks like the power of Satan eliminated in your life bit by bit until the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. How? My sin is too great. How? You see, here's the thing, brothers and sisters. I am speaking to the last day people of God. Now is not the time for milk. Now is the time for solid food. Let's not stick to drinking cow milk here on earth. We're waiting for the milk and honey of heaven. What does that look like? Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13. I want this to be so participatory that I'd ask one of you to read it out loud, but there's no mic out there, so I'll read it for you guys. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13. And I'll slow down a little bit, because when I get excited, somebody told me I speak too fast. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus is coming soon. And if Jesus is coming soon, there is no way that you'll be prepared if you're stuck on having Egypt and Babylon in your bellies. Egypt and Babylon in your minds. You see, the problem is, if you crave the foods and appetites and inclinations, if you love the things of this world, there is no way you think God is big to overcome the walls of Jericho. There's no way. Because sin dulls your appreciation for the mighty power of God. Notice Hebrews 5, verse 13, and it says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Chapter 6, verse 1 goes on and says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying of hands, of resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. There is victory if you allow Jesus to be it for you. Let's get a little personal. I have a lot of Bible verses for you today. See, as Seventh-day Adventist people, we are the people of the book. There is no one in the world who knows the Bible better than us. But it is not enough that the Bible is known by your mind. It should transform your heart. Get away from Egypt. You see, in Numbers chapter 14, did you notice they said, maybe it's a good idea if we go back to Egypt. By the time you get to Jeremiah, when they're headed to Babylon, because they continued with that Egypt mentality, you remember what Jeremiah was warning them about in Jeremiah 42 and 44 and 43? Jeremiah says, don't go to Egypt. And the people of God said, actually, I think we should go back to Egypt. You see, Satan is trying to puff up all your issues so that you think that they're bigger than God. Get on your knees and praise the Most High for He is so big and mighty to save. Remember that little kid's song, When I am afraid, I will trust in you? The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. See, the problem is when you lean on your own understanding, that happens to crave, that happens to crave more Egypt than the manna from heaven, of course you're going to feel defeated. But when you are eating the bread of life, you start realizing, oh, maybe Jesus can destroy the chains of my life. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the Word of God. Yeah. James talks about be not just hearers of the Word, but be doers of the Word. See, when you eat the Word and you start working out, that nourishment carries over to your DNA. And it pumps, and it pumps your bones with strength. You start being a servant of the living God who believes that Jesus is able and willing. Remember, if you are willing, you can make me well. And Jesus says, I'm willing, be made well. See, the ten spies were saying, there's no chance for you. Did you see the size of those grapes? Those guys are big. We are very small. There's no chance. Just give it a break. We'll wait till the pillar of fire destroys them. See, that's not how faith works. When you believe, God opens a way for you to walk in that belief. The righteous shall live by... Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says, Not that I have already attained. It's not self. Christ our righteousness is not about the self. Or am already perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold on me. 13 says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Remember, Egypt was behind them. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, right? The author and perfecter of our faith. Are you headed to the heavenly Canaan? And do you believe that it is yours? The verse ends with this. Not forgetting those, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21 and 23. I invite all of God's people to study to show thyself approved. Beware of the ten spies who tell you, you will not make it. That is a defeated gospel. But we as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that in Christ there is victory. Test all things, hold fast to what is good. Abstain. From every evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. It does not say may the God of peace sanctify you a little bit. I went to church on Sabbath. That's enough for me. But then you notice that on Monday and Tuesday, you feel defeated. You ever notice that when you don't pick up your Bible, you feel a little weak? In fact, my wife can notice why I'm cranky. I can notice it in my very bones, in my heart. When I am not spending time with the loving Savior, I feel disgusting. Do you know why? Because Satan is always at the door and his desire is to rule over you, but you must overcome him. That's what God told Cain. In. That's what God told Cain before he killed Abel. Satan is at the door trying to remind you that you will not make it to the land that's already promised to you. Brothers and sisters, is the promised land yours? The beauty about that message is you get to invite other people to come into that promised land as well. How do you respond to when somebody tells you about Jesus and it looks like this? Are you a Christian? Yeah, but church is boring. I mean, I want you to be a Christian. I want you to come to church, but it's boring. 
Notice how effective that would be in telling the world that Jesus is king. The world wants to know, is this Jesus guy, is this God, the Son of God, is Jesus the Most High God, is that high priest any good? Can he really deliver me from oppression? Test all things, hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved. How? Blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so sorry. Get a little excited. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who also will do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. Do not stone the prophets. For the greatest prophet that ever lived, our Lord and Savior and God, Jesus Christ, he himself was killed for saying, I am the answer to all your chains. They killed him because they had Egypt in their mouth and Egypt in their hearts. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. It doesn't say half assurance. You see, the thing is this. Before Jesus comes, He wants your whole heart. You can't be thinking about the leeks and onions of Egypt because it is the very thing that reminds you and makes you believe that Jesus is not able. I repeat myself many times for a reason. Because God sees your reality very different than how you see your reality. Oftentimes you will see great clouds looming over your heads, but Jesus sees, if only you knew, how you are destined to be with me forevermore. If only you knew that any attack and accusation, any pain in your life, I already have a plan to deal with it. I just need you to believe me having full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It gets better, guys. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. God wants you surrendered. He wants you awake. <laughs> he wants you alive and well with His Spirit within you. I don't know what you're excited about next week or the week before. I'm, we're going on a men's camping trip soon with my good friends here. And I'm excited about that, but I'll tell you something. We ought to be very excited about the second coming of Jesus. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming very soon. You got to know, you have to know that there is victory in that Savior. I'll continue. Notice this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 says, Do all things without complaining. Oh. <laughs> Gets real hard here. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault. See, the Bible's very clear. Your identity must die and Christ's identity in you must come alive. See, in the end, when the people ask you, where are you from? Before you say the United States of America or Liberia or Colombia or Mexico or Haiti, the world needs to know you are a citizen of the heavenly Canaan. Imagine being proud about a country and a kingdom that is going to perish. Does that make sense? You hear me, Monique? You hear me? Jesus is coming soon, 
and he's waiting for you to know there's victory in Jesus. Notice this. Again, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked generation and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. You cannot have a defeated gospel to preach to the world. You cannot preach to people in the bondage of cigarettes and say, well, I still struggle with cigarettes. And you struggle with cigarettes, and Jesus saves. He's delivered me, but I'm still not delivered. I mean, he's delivered me from cigarettes, but he hasn't delivered me, really. But he's delivered me. Does that make sense? See, that's how goofy the ten spies sounded like. God is almighty, but he's not that mighty like those walls. Those giants are big, but God is still mighty. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? Let your lights shine to the world that you are no longer bound by sin. Does that make sense, right? Praise God. I see some heads nodding. This one is really fun. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember how they conquer him in Revelation chapter 12 when the enemy accuses them? Do you remember? See, we're going to need to know this because in the last days, the world will try to force worship on God's last day people in the world. And if you have been eating spiritual McDonald's and Domino's, you're not going to think it's possible to go through these hard times. Do not eat spiritual, do not eat spiritual twists. Do not eat the leeks and onions. Do not believe that the Egyptian way of life is better than the milk and honey of promised land. And the verse goes like this, and they conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Brothers and sisters, is Jesus your conqueror today? Is Jesus your conqueror today? All it takes is belief. Philippians 1, 6, 10 through 11, being confident of this very thing, he who has begun a good work in you shall complete it until the day of Christ. Verse 10 says that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Ellen G. White says this in Signs of the Times, and I think you guys should really look at this. See, there's a misunderstanding often when we talk about righteousness by faith. There's two camps in Adventism. Now, one camp believes that righteousness by faith is a nice phrase, but it can't be a reality. And the other camp believes in what the pen of inspiration has been saying for thousands of years. Be ye perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Man is to be perfect in his sphere, even as God is perfect in his sphere. How can such a lofty standard be reached? The required perfection is based on the perfection of who? Christ, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He gave the command requiring perfection. He who was by birth a human being Though allied to divinity, he has passed over the road we are to tread, and he says, without me you can do nothing. But with him we can do everything. Thus, a perfect character can be obtained. God never issues a command without furnishing the grace sufficient for its fulfillment. If God promises you the promised land, you better believe it is yours. The only problem is that we have things in our life that keep on whispering in our ears, you can't do it, you're a cripple. You can't do it. This is why Jesus in the gospel says, your faith has made you well, daughter. Because if every day we wake up and we believe, Christ does the rest. Move in faith. And she ends with saying, ample provision has been made that man shall be a partaker of the divine nature. 
1 John 2, 5, please open it up in your Bibles if you'd like to, to read the surrounding verses. I have it here on the screen. It couldn't be more clear than this. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is what? Perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. What is your testimony? Brothers and sisters, there's a tale of two Israels in the Bible. There's the one that died in the wilderness because of unbelief, and there's the one that believed the good report that comes from the Most High God, and they overcame. What is your testimony? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 to 16, and we're almost done, brothers and sisters. We're almost there. We're almost to the heavenly Canaan. Hold on. Stay awake. Can you imagine 100 plus degrees in the wilderness? It was hot. Egypt sounded real nice because they had the Nile. You remember that? I was just in Mexicali with my wife. And I was telling Jason over there that we, we came back from Mexicali. My wife is from Mexico. And I'm telling you, I almost melted. I couldn't deal with it. See, at that moment, that's where you'll do anything for a bottle of water. At that moment, you start having crazy talk like, maybe slavery is nice. Because, you know, the devil has a real nice refrigerator, and he has really nice drinks in there. As long as you're tied in his house and you can never leave, he'll give you all the water you want. But the thing is, it is not living water. God can bring water from the rock. Do not let the heat or the old age or the attractions of the world keep you away from Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 and 16. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former's lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written... Be holy as I am holy. There is a high standard that you are called into because you are Christ's alone. Many of whom God has qualified to do excellent work accomplish very little because they attempt very little. Thousands pass through life as if they had no definite object for which to live, no standard to reach. Such will obtain a reward proportionate to their works. Did the children of Israel get what they asked for? Absolutely. They spoke doubt, they received their just reward. But when you speak faith, do you know what happened to Caleb? Did he end up getting his inheritance? You know, he was an old man. Only him and Joshua from that generation made it to the promised land. And I'm here to tell you that we can be that generation that lives by the righteousness of Jesus. Remember that you will never reach a higher standard than you yourself set. Then set your mark high and step by step, even though it be by painful effort, by self-denial and sacrifice, ascend the whole length of the ladder of progress. Let nothing hinder you. Opposing circumstances should create a firm determination to overcome them. The breaking down of one barrier will give you greater ability and courage to go forward. Press with determination in the right direction and circumstances will be your helpers, not your hindrances. The hard things in your life will actually help you overcome the bigger things. Cling to Jesus. That's basically what it's saying. Don't worry, my brothers. I think we're almost done. I'm going to ask you, people of God, to stand up. Because we're going on a walk. After the 40 years, God's people were told, will you live by faith now? And they said, all right, we'll do what you say. How many times did they have to march around Jericho? Anybody remember? Come on, last day people, Seventh-day Adventist people, you know your Bibles better than anyone. How many times did the people of God march around the city in total? Thirteen. 
You ready to march? You ready to blow your trumpet so loud that the neighborhood can't help to know that Jesus reigns? In fact, I want you to think about how curious those Mormons across the street would be when they start hearing God's people and seeing them marching around. Maybe we'll ask them, but you have to march. 1 John 5, 4, please read it with me. I invite you to read this with me. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Christ our righteousness. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because through thy mercies we are not consumed for your compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We invite your law to be written in our hearts and we invite the mouth of those who accuse and those who do not believe that we can overcome to be shut. Father, we surrender to you completely that the Mormons and the Baptists and the Catholics and the Jesuits we even pray that the Buddhists and the Hindus may be converted to the only true way, which is Jesus Christ in his word, the Adventist faith. We love you, Lord, and we pray that you will be with our people, Lord. We pray that you will empty us of ourselves and destroy the chains that are in our lives. May we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.